What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we are picking back up again with Incredible Hulk stuff, but because of the fact that the last Incredible Hulk video that we did in terms of any real measure of a story was part of the Ultimate Universe, I feel like a little bit of a refresher is in order for people who are uh, new to my channel or people who are coming back and have kind of forgotten where it was that we had, we had left off when it came to the, the main Hulk continuity. So up until this point, we've basically covered three stories. We covered uh, Planet Hulk and World War Hulk, which I consider that to be just one cohesive story since one leads directly into the other. You could really read Planet Hulk and World War Hulk as a singular event in and of itself. Uh, we also covered the first volume of Red Hulk, and then we covered Scar, Son of Hulk, the origin of the Incredible Hulk's son. Now, those three stories basically all led to this particular moment with Incredible Hulk number 600 and what's effectively the prelude to Fall of Hulks and World War Hulks. What, of course, Planet Hulk and World War Hulk did is it showed us how angry Bruce Banner can get, but those stories basically ended, or I guess World War Hulk ended, with Bruce Banner being uh, taken back to a S.H.I.E.L.D. facility where he was being held as a prisoner. What Scar, Son of Hulk also did is it kind of came out of left field, but it basically told us in the moments before the destruction of Crown City on Sakaar that led to the deaths of the Incredible Hulk's wife and, and all of his followers that his wife had basically spat out their unborn child and then kept that child protected within a basically a rocky cocoon using the old power, which allows those who wield it to manipulate the planet of Sakaar itself, kept Scar protected. And then that led into his own story whereby he learned about his father and he sought his father out. And then that story ended with him basically being sent to Earth. And so that allows him to come to the stories right now, which we'll pick up in Incredible Hulk number 601, I think, and it's actually where Scar fights his father and the Juggernaut. It's actually pretty badass. It's a pretty awesome story. But Red Hulk Volume 1, the, the last piece of this little puzzle, Red Hulk Volume 1 it came along and it said, okay, after the events of World War Hulk, when Banner had been taken prisoner, I guess been held, uh, you know, three miles underground, another Incredible Hulk popped up. Another Hulk just showed up. He was red and no one knew who he was. And in fact, even within the confines of the story at this point right now, we still don't know who he is. Now, in hindsight, as the reader, we know because the story's been out for eight years and it was revealed something like six years ago. And so we know who the Red Hulk is, but within the confines of the story, and I kind of like to keep this uh, keep this allure going for the people who are not familiar with the Hulk mythos, we didn't know what was going on with him. All we knew was that he showed up, he basically took Thor's hammer, he lifted Thor's hammer, uh, he was able to take out Thor, he took out She-Hulk, he took out Iron Man, S.H.I.E.L.D., I mean, he just laid waste to everybody. He literally just started pummeling through almost the entirety of the superhero community. But at the end of that story, at the end of Red Hulk Volume 1, Red Hulk Hulk seemed to have been defeated by Bruce Banner, but as Banner was going away, he was suddenly shot in the back by uh, Doc Samson, and then we didn't really know what happened after that. All we knew was that Doc Samson seems to have been working against the Hulk as a spy or something along those lines. What this story does, what Hulk number 600 does, is it basically brings those things back, but it shows us a lot of what's going on behind the scenes in terms of how it was the Red Hulk came into existence. Now, because of the fact that this is, again, continually being written by Jeff Loeb, he gives us a refresher and basically all the stuff that I'd pretty much just told you guys and what was going on. On, but because of the fact that Banner had been taken prisoner, people were just kind of curious as to what was happening. I mean, Banner having been taken away, you know, having been shot by uh, by Doc Samson, no one really knew what was happening. Instead, what we actually end up doing is we pick up with Ben Urich. Now, Ben Urich is an extremely important character in the realm of Marvel Comics, and this is actually pretty significant considering the fact that he's not a superhero. Ben Urich's a reporter. Those of you guys who remember my videos on Civil War, we had basically learned about Ben Urich as a guy who was operating behind the scenes, essentially chronically the entirety of Civil War. That's where Frontline came in. Civil War Frontline was basically Ben Urich sitting on the sidelines watching all these events unfold and showing us how Civil War was impacting the average person, how it was impacting the small time superheroes. With well, the main Civil War event itself focused on, you know, Tony Stark and it focused on Captain America fighting each other and this huge battle between the most popular superheroes, you know, Frontline showed us the small time superheroes. And so because of that, because of the fact that Ben Urich had been a huge part of Marvel Comics even before Civil War, he's always been there. He's always been kind of the behind the scenes, showing us what's going on, but he's also the reporter that everybody's learned to trust. And Marvel does that. Every once in a while, Marvel will take an ordinary citizen like Night Nurse, for example, and they'll say, here is the one person everybody trusts. When they're superheroes that have masks and they don't want people to know what their identities are, they go to Night Nurse to be taken care of instead of going to a traditional hospital. So that way they don't have to worry about losing their secret identity.
opportunities. You know, Night Nurse will work on them as she needs to. She'll heal their wounds, and then they'll go on their own way, and they'll be superheroes again. And so, you know, Marvel does the same thing with Ben Urich. Again, he's just this reporter. Now, the trust that heroes have for Ben Urich comes into play when he's basically called to a secret meeting by She-Hulk. Now, She-Hulk kind of refreshes Ben Urich on what's going on, but we also learn that Ben Urich knows a lot of things that he's not supposed to know. For example, he knows about everything that was going on behind the scenes with World War Hulk in the sense that Bruce Banner had effectively been taken out by satellites, although it wasn't really sure exactly how it happened. More so than that, when it comes to the idea of Red Hulk, Ben Urich knows more than he should. A really good example of this is when he's talking to She-Hulk and he says, okay, as far as I've been able to tell, or at least as far as, uh, as, far as, as I've been able to tell from all this, you know, Red Hulk uh, had essentially taken out Abomination. Red Hulk had infiltrated its shield and the Baxter building. You know, he's done all these things and, and She-Hulk's kind of astounded because, you know, she repeats all of it back, but she's like, that's all supposed to be classified. You know, you're not supposed to know any of that stuff. And so what she does is she says, you're going to come with me. You and I and, and a couple other people are going to go on a mission and we're basically going to crack this wide open. We're going to show what's going on behind the scenes and we're going to let the world know what's happening. Now, this is a huge gambit for She-Hulk because if it backfires in her face, she'll be incarcerated. She'll be thrown in jail. S.H.I.E.L.D. will throw a black bag over her head and she'll never be seen or heard from again. And so it, it's one of these really weird situations where she's taking a huge risk. Not only that, once we arrive at this S.H.I.E.L.D. bunker that Bruce Banner was supposed to have been held at, we find out that not only is Doc Samson here alongside Ben Urick, but so is Peter Parker. Now, the reason why Peter Parker is here is because She-Hulk says, you're going to need a photographer. You're going to need somebody you can trust. If there's anyone out there that Ben Urick trusts, it's Spider-Man. And the reason for this is because Ben Urick and Spider-Man go back a long ways in Marvel Comics. They have a huge history. I think Spider-Man was actually the one that convinced Ben Urick not to release the identity of Daredevil when he figured out that Daredevil was Matt Murdock. Uh, it was a huge deal, you know, but, but the two of them go back and forth because they both work in the reporting field. They're both part of uh, the Daily Bugle. You know, they both report to J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robertson. I mean, they have a lot of similarities between the two, but because of the fact that he trusts Peter Parker so much, he's like, look, Peter Parker will keep our role hidden here. If it comes to the point that no one needs to know that we were here, no one needs to know who it was to snap these pictures, Peter Parker will make sure these pictures get to where they need to go and no one will know who took them. Not only that, we learn from uh, from Doc Samson that the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who were here are not actually S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. So that's the first tip that Jeff Loeb gives us. This is not an actual S.H.I.E.L.D. bunker. Instead, this is uh, seems to be a bunker operated independently by some third party organization or nefarious group. Now, where Doc Samson goes in and pulls out some costumes that belong to AIM, to Advanced Idea Mechanics, the uh, various scientists that are trying to take over the world using technology and science, what he also says is that these S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are basically upgraded life model decoys. Now, I want to talk about this for a second because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the TV show, which Jeff Loeb is currently, you know, running, ended on the idea of life model decoys. This is actually something kind of cool because when I was watching the show, I was like, life model decoys, and they showed May was actually a life model decoy when the real May was being held prisoner. What it seems like Marvel's doing with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. right now is they're taking the road of Nick Fury versus S.H.I.E.L.D., where life model decoys take over S.H.I.E.L.D., and Nick Fury, along with maybe one or two other people, are able to bring them all down. That's the story that Marvel wrote, where Nick Fury stopped reporting to the 12 anonymous individuals and basically made himself executive director and he was the sole person in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's basically how that story unfolded in Marvel Comics is where that came from. But I kind of felt like it was worth mentioning because life model decoys are, are exactly what they sound like. They're literally life model decoys with the exception of people who can somehow tap into machinery like Tony Stark or people like Forge who intuitively know how machines work. No one would know that they're life model decoys. They look, they talk, they act like real people. They sweat, they spit. I mean, they, they do all the kinds of stuff that normal human human beings do. And so it's impossible, almost impossible to know the difference between a life model decoy and an actual human. Not only that, once we get in here, once we get into the S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, facility, we actually learn that MODOK is running the show. Now, we've almost never talked about MODOK. And there's a reason for that, because MODOK is... Whew, he is a villain that I don't really care too much for, just because I feel, I feel like he's really cliche, but he's effectively leading what's called the intelligentsia. Now, we'll get to that here in a minute, especially once we get into like World War Hulks and all that kind of stuff, because things get really, really crazy. But in essence, what Doc Samson tells us is that MODOK is trying to create a gamma powered super soldier program. They're literally trying to make what made Captain America great, and they're trying to make incredible Hulk super soldiers. That's basically all they're trying to do here. Now, of course, what Doc Samson also says is that he had effectively been brainwashed. 
He had been used by Modok for the purpose of not only leading them here, but also feeding them information in the efforts that once they get here, they would be easily subdued. Now, the funny thing about this, and maybe it's something that I had missed, but once they once they break in, once Doc Samson shows up at this location and starts tearing everything up when he turns into his Hulk form, uh, ultimately, you know, Modok doesn't really seem to know what's going on. But the conflict here is pretty straightforward because the idea is that they want to, even, even if they are discovered, even if they are seen, the goal is to get in, get what they need, and get out before, quote unquote, he arrives. Now, we don't learn who it is that they're talking about until we have Ben Yurik as this last man kind of watching these events unfold. Because remember, he's a normal guy. He has no powers. But then suddenly he's met with the arrival of the Red Hulk. And that's really what they were worried about. Because right now, there's no one that can stand against the Red Hulk. As it stands right now in Marvel Comics, in this story, there does not seem to be anyone who can hold their own against Red Hulk. Ares couldn't do it. Carol Danvers couldn't do it. She-Hulk couldn't do it. Thor couldn't do it. No one can stand against him. He's taken every last one of them out. Now, the cool thing about this, though, is that Spider-Man suddenly comes in. Now, again, you know, Peter Parker being here, Ben Urich didn't really seem to put the dots together that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but of course, Peter Parker takes off, changes into his costume, and begins engaging in a fight with Red Hulk. And something that I'd like you to notice here is it shows us how smart Peter Parker is and his ability to fight foes and then carry that experience over to other foes. What he does is he basically starts running circles around Red Hulk. And the point that he makes is, yeah, man, like I've fought the Incredible Hulk before. And sure, you're a little bit different in terms of your physical appearance and in terms of your powers. But at the end of the day, you're a giant lumbering beast just like he was, and you can't hit what you can't catch. And that's 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 exactly how he plays it. He's just like, if you can't catch me, you can't hit me. So all I have to do is either wear you out, tire you out, or I can simply just ham you up in spider webbing and then call it a day. Now, the funny thing about this, though, is that this is Red Hulk. And as intelligent as Peter Parker is, the Red Hulk is that much more strategic. And so because of the fact that it's, it's literally military intelligence going against scientific intelligence, at the end of the day, Parker just doesn't really seem to be able to pull it off on his own. And so this is when we officially get the return of Bruce Banner in this instance, whereby as he watches Peter Parker being manhandled <laughs> by Red Hulk, he suddenly emerges from his tank and just begins attacking the Red Hulk. Now, under normal circumstances, I would have looked at this and said, okay, here we go again, Jeff Loeb. It's Red Hulk versus Green Hulk. And yeah, it's cool, but it really, it was a one hit wonder. It was cool the first time, now it's wearing thin. That's not what he does. He says, hey, on the surface, it looks that way. On the surface, it looks like it's just, oh, it's just Red Hulk fighting Green Hulk. That's not the case. Instead, what Red Hulk says is he has the ability to absorb different forms of radiation. And the radiation that he chooses to absorb here is the gamma radiation of Bruce Banner. Effectively, he strips Bruce Banner of his ability to become the Incredible Hulk. Now, of course, with the Incredible Hulk, we know this is not permanent. And in fact, by the next issue, he'll be Incredible Hulk again. <laughs> but for the time being, it actually works out pretty well. Now, this is where I wanted to kind of step in for a second and, and move away from this quick little thing and talk about some of Jeff Loeb's other work. Because when it came to Red Hulk, we had a couple other story arcs. We basically had Red versus Green or Hulk Red Green. And then we had, uh, I think it was called Hulk No More. It was it was kind of a weird thing, but basically it was it was self-contained stories. Originally, they were in continuity in the sense that Joe Fixit Hulk came back. You know, he was fighting against uh, the Sentry and Carol Danvers. And then eventually he turned into the Incredible Hulk and then he was fighting Wendigos. It was really kind of weird. Red Hulk was fighting She-Hulk Hulk and the Lady Liberator, so Valkyrie, Susan Storm, uh, Aurora Monroe, uh, Thundra. He was holding his own against them. But then what happened is Jeff Loeb came back and wrote a story where it was basically Red Hulk becomes a Silver Surfer. Uh, they were all kind of fighting Galactus at the behest of a conflict that was initiated by the Grandmaster and the Collector, who were elders of the universe, and then they retconned it all. The, you know, when I say that, you know, now that I say that, I really feel like I need to do videos on that. Like, I'm going to tie that video. Red Hulk becomes the Silver Surfer. Like, that... Man, the views. <laughs> But no, um, it was it was it was kind of cool. But the reason why I skipped over that is because what Jeff Loeb did is he came back at the end of all that and he basically retconned it all. And he said, okay, none of that happened. Instead, it's Red Hulk Volume One straight into the Incredible Hulk number six hundred. And so that's really kind of the reading order for those of you guys who are trying to figure out what to do with the, with with Red Hulk. It's literally Red Hulk Volume One and then the Incredible Hulk number six hundred going into Fall of Hulks and World War Hulk. So uh, especially once we get the Hulk pool, Deadpool guys, Deadpool becomes a Hulk. Like, I'm just throwing it out there right now. Deadpool becomes a Hulk, and that, that story will be told. Do not worry. I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> but in the midst of all this conflict and, and all this, this battling and so on, the Red Hulk seems to have no concern over the fact that he's basically laying waste to this facility. Not only that, but because of the fact that this facility is being destroyed the way it is, it's ultimately leading to its own destruction. And so what ends up happening is in the last few seconds or so, we basically have A-Bomb. We have Rick Jones saving, you know, Ben Urich and Peter Parker coming out alive. And ultimately, it's, it's just kind of this scenario where things begin to wind down. And so what we end up doing is we basically end up picking up with Ben Urich and Ben 
Ben Yurik is suddenly met with Red Hulk again. Now, Red Hulk, you know, of course, kind of takes some few jabs at here when Ben Yurik's like, I can't believe you lived. And Red Hulk's like, well, yeah, of course I lived. Like, why, why would I, why would I die in the, in the explosion of a building? Like, I'm, I'm Red Hulk, damn it. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't die and I don't die and when buildings blow up, you know? And so what he does is he basically says, you know, I'm under the impression that you're writing a story. I heard you're writing a story about everything that you saw. And he says, if you do that, then you'll be in a meeting one day and then suddenly everybody's going to die. I'm gonna bring that building crashing down. And so what he basically does is he is he tells us by way of this story that is never going to go into publication, that it's much like Watergate in the sense that it all started like a basic break-in. It was nothing too big, but then it spiraled out of control. And that ultimately, MODOK had basically activated, you know, advanced idea mechanics. They all began working together that General Thunderbolt Ross has committed treason against the US government and SHIELD, although we don't exactly know how, and that they're effectively starting a super soldier program using gamma radiation to create their own variety of hulks. And so again, what this did is it basically just kind of lays the groundwork and says, okay, here is the prelude, quote unquote, to Fall of Hulks and World War Hulks. Here's how it is that all the superheroes end up turning into Hulks. Here's this massive conflict that's underway when it's just Hulk versus Hulk when everybody is a Hulk. It's really kind of weird. But in any event, again, you know, this is just kind of an introductory issue. This is setting the stage for things to come. But in the next video, what we'll do is we'll actually kind of wrap back around. We'll basically cover the story of, you know, Bruce Banner, Hulk versus his son, because it's really kind of weird is that seems to run alongside Fall of Hulks and World War Hulks as best as I can tell. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and and cover those stories and then we'll jump into fall of hulks and world war hulks but if you guys are new here to comics explain make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and leave a comment down below let me know what you guys think about incredible hulk stuff so far because i'm actually really interested to see what you all think and uh yeah i will catch you all later peace